Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My special guest today is Peter Simpson Morgan. He's a legendary value fund manager from Australia. Uh, Peter ran Perpetual, where he managed $13 billion, averaging 14.3% over his reign from 1994 to 2002, when he kicked out his own firm, 452 Capital, which grew to $4 billion under management at its peak. In 2009, he was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer and given only a few months to live, at which point he wound up 452. We're going to talk to Peter right after this. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquire's Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquire's Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquire's Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. G'day, Peter. How are you? Good, Toby. Good to speak to you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your investment strategy. For folks who don't know, you're a value manager, but I always say value is a very broad church. So how do you how do you describe yourself as a value manager? Um, I think the you know I think the, the closest approximation is somewhat similar to Peter Lynch, um, but in the context of the Australian market, is is very cyclical based. Um, it's it's the index itself is based around. Uh, banks um, and mining stocks, depending on what point of the cycle you are with, with those two um, companies. Um, there are some fast-growing companies down here, to use the Peter Lynch phrase, but nowhere near, the, um, nowhere near the context that they are in the US. I think uh, one of the interesting things about the, US, the Aussie market that I've noticed over the, the years is that half of it is financials, which is banks and insurers. And about fifteen to thirty percent is uh, basic materials, and so that leaves only a very small sliver. That's sort of uh, what traditional uh, Peter Lynch or Buffett style investors might go after. So, how did you handle that uh, when you were investing those big sums of money? Well, it's you know it's also there's, there's a couple of other dynamics playing a part as well. Um, you know, when I started at Perpetual in 1991. Um, superannuation or the retirement savings system of Australia had just uh, had basically just come into force and uh, you know in rough terms it was about a hundred billion dollars in superannuation um, today that figure is approaching 2.5 trillion dollars and there's been extraordinary growth um, when I started at uh, perpetual um, you know everyone wanted to be a stockbroker um, and then you know, obviously that gave us a group of us and a break at perpetual to get into funds management, but um, the funds management industry was just starting. And um, and when we came together at perpetual, um, the, the the flagship product, the industrial share fund, was around eighty million dollars. And uh, as you said at the introduction, you know when I left and even today, um, equities at perpetual are uh, you know plus ten billion dollars. Um, and you know, so you go from being a small fund manager to being a bigger one, and and also in the context of back then, the Australian market was somewhat more diverse in terms of the quality of companies. And one of the things that I've noticed uh, over those, you know, the last 25 years is the number of companies listed has also uh, fallen. The quality of those companies has also fallen. And at the same time, the number of fund managers today we've probably got, you know, around 500 domestic equity fund managers. In Australia, as I said, there was probably twenty when I started. What, why do you think that the number of companies has fallen and the quality of the companies has fallen? What's the cause of that? Well, there's been a lot of takeover activity. I mean, it's uh, you know, as we all know, one of the great dynamics is that uh, again, when I started, interest rates in Australia were double digit, fifteen uh, percent. Uh, you know, got up to eighteen, twenty percent. You know, at that you know that the at the recession we had to have basically in those times and today you know the cash rate here is around 1.5 percent and also with the growth in superannuation the growth in superannuation or or money going into the market it's led to more and more concentration in the market takeover activity as i said and um 
you know, the biggest dynamic for the Australian market down here today is, you know, where the money end up, ends up. You know, it's got to go overseas. Um, you know, infrastructure's played its part, but so is uh, so is low interest rates in that uh, in that, um, that that growth of that sector. So let's go back to when you first started investing. You were you were trained as an accountant. I was an accountant. Yeah, I was trained as an accountant. I mean, if you go back one step from that. Uh, you know, I probably wasn't the smartest kid at school, and you know, you you, you finish school, um, you don't really know what you want to do. And I just sort of had in my mind that, um, you know, if I kept that option open in terms of accounting, um, I'd see where it led. And I did accounting at university. Didn't really learn much about accounting at university. It was only when I did the professional year as a chartered accountant that I really learned accounting. And and from that, uh, I worked for a chartered accountant for for three and a half years and then um, I saw a job or took a job at uh, a company you might remember down here called BT Australia as an internal order and the only reason I took that job was to perhaps get to New York and at the time BT had about th- 300 people working at it. Um, this is around uh, you know 1985 and financial markets under Labor and Paul Keating were deregulating. Um, uh, foreign exchange was um, was floated. You know, the, the, the currency was floated. Um, stock breaking, fixed charges were changing, and it was a it was an exciting time. But as an internal auditor, I'd walked into this uh, organisation that uh, was uh, entrepreneurial, a lot of young people, and was growing very fast, and was effectively taking on the big incumbent. Um, trading banks and uh, the AMP and National Mutual Mutual Societies, and it was so exciting. And I, you know, to be honest with you, I was walking around in, the, in an environment where I was learning as I went along. But I could see that uh, this place was successful; it was going somewhere. And for the, for the first time, I'd seen an Australian company actually actually reward or be broken up in terms of profit centres. So. You know, the FX department had to stand up for its, you know, had, had to stand up and be profitable, every every department. And the previous companies that I'd ordered in Australia hadn't had, hadn't had anything like that. And as time went on, you know, in that, those next, uh, you know, text year, two years ago, you know, I, I had got into my mind that I wanted to try and find the next BT Australia, but I wanted to get into financial markets. And I saw an ad uh, in 87 for a, a small ad in a newspaper for a stockbroking firm, applied for that job and then started as, you know, as a stockbroker in June 87. And uh, That must have been <laughs> quite an introduction to... Uh... Well, it was. I can still remember going for that job, Toby, in the sense that, to his credit, the, 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 the chief financial officer said, you know, pointed to a chart on the wall and he said to me, I still, still, still can remember him saying it, I don't know where this... This market ends, but we're pretty high, and you have to keep in mind that you know stockbrokers are pretty, you know, for want of a better word, a variable business, and you know you may not have your job tomorrow. Well, you know, three months later, as we all know, or four months later, as we all know, the the markets in October '87, you know, lost 20% in one day, um, and and I think you know, looking back on it and, and remembering it, you know, it then we then you know I then went into a period where. You know, you had to you had to survive, and even in the early years of perpetual, that you know we never really knew whether we had a job the next day um, um, for you know two or three years because it was you know they were, they were they were pretty sour times. And you know, just talking about eighty seven for a moment, you know, I mean, um, sorry, October eighty seven. Um, and I can still remember walking in on that day when the Dow's fallen five hundred points. It was a, you know it was a Tuesday morning here, and whereas a telex coming in from overseas was you know maybe. Um, you know, a metre long in terms of buy and sell orders or two or three metres long in terms of buy and sell orders. The, 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 the telex that day was 50 metres long and it was predominantly <laughs> selling it. And, um, and it all led from there. Now, added to that, I probably wasn't the greatest stockbroker in the world in the sense that I, I was never really comfortable selling something that um, um, I wasn't comfortable with. But luckily... Um, as as people were retrenched and um, the industry contracted somewhat, I was given an account called Perpetual um, to look after as a stockbroker, and that led to an introduction to a guy called Anton Tagliaferro, who had just gone to Perpetual at the time, and 
from about 88 onwards, we just we just sort of grew together. And eventually I went up and joined Anton and another guy called John Murray um, that have gone on to bigger and bigger things that, you know, in funds management as well, uh, like I did and others have. And we all came together uh, based around that. And as I said at the start, you know, when, I, when we all joined Perpetual, the, the funds under management in the industrial share fund were around $80 million. And, um, but the importance also with regards to that is that the team that had left had left a portfolio of, you know, under-researched, somewhat illiquid, very good quality companies that, um, such as, you know, Brickwork, Sol, Patterson, Gibson Chemicals, Australian Chemical Holdings, uh, Plum Rose, Reckon Coleman, um, uh, Amalgamated Holdings. Basically, a lot of them were asset plays. As I said, a lot of them were under-researched and, you know, we basically in those days had to go out and do, a, a, you know, our own research. The reason why they were under-researched is there, was, there wasn't, they were great companies, but there wasn't a lot of liquidity in them and brokers weren't, you know, weren't encouraged, encouraged to follow them. And that's basically in a, in a roundabout fashion how it all sort of came together. So how did you develop your your style? So when you you, you inherited the portfolio, and it's pretty yeah. impressive that you can remember all the names in it this many years oh, later. Oh, there's a lot. There's a lot, Toby. And that's what, you know, I keep thinking about it today, you know. And, it, and, and I, mean, I know this is a cliche. Look, and people used to ring me. I still remember a broker ringing me up and saying, you do this job for nothing. You know, I, I would have done it. And so would we have all. It was just, it was like walking into something um, you know, when you find something that you love, you know, you, it, it, we, we loved it. But, you know, at the same context, we were going through the recession we had to have. You know, on the other side of that, I can remember, you know, quite vividly, ANZ and Westpac, the two major banks, in a lot of trouble. They were going for all money and, uh, in 91, 92. And, you know, there's ups and downs in it. But the beauty of that, the beauty of what we walked into is that we'd gone through the 87 crash, or the companies had, and they'd survived. Um, and if we, you know, if we would have started in early '87 as fund managers, we may well have got caught up in the, you know, the boom of the, you know, the entrepreneurs like Alan Bond and Christopher Scase and that sort of stuff. But you know, there was a lot of things that came together, and then you, you, you're trying to put it all together. And you know, again, if you know, if you want to talk about books at the same sort of time, I think you know, Anton, myself, and maybe John all read, you know, Peter Lynch's. One up on Wall Street. It all sort of came together. It all sort of came together in a funny sort of way. So that's what made you Lynch style investors. You read that book early on in your career and tried to implement that. Well, it explained it, it explained to us actually what we were doing or trying to do. Um, it, but the other important thing, I, you know, I, I should also stress with regards to professional, it just wasn't the fund managers. Um, there was a very good team that came together in terms of the, the sales team came together. And even the guy that was on the phones to the staff as it was building up was it was a great guy. He could you know if the, uh, you know if a client had troubles, he could take him somewhere else with his thought process and, and calm him down. And the sales team, when they were selling the perpetual product, and we we're only starting, they didn't sell the fund itself. They sold equity, equities, the importance of investing in equities, um, in the sense that uh, you know they'd go out with a story like the. The, the, the dividend growth story where a company's earnings would grow and then suddenly sell the perpetual funds on the other end. It wasn't it wasn't an aggressive sell and they were terrific and, you know, and we're all learning at the same time. And, you know, I've also got to say that there was no guarantee perpetual was going to be, you know, what it became. It was, it could have been shut down, you know, the next day. So you started out there, you weren't, were, were you managing the portfolio initially? Or I, did start, you- I, I, I went up there, John, Anton was there running the portfolio um, and Anton's gone and done his, you know, done his own thing with the Investors Mutual as, as time has passed. John Murray was there, but he didn't stay long. He then went to Maple Brown and he then went on to Perennials and he did his own thing. And I was effectively the number three guy that fell into it and uh, took over it from there in, in 1991. And, um, and just, you know, he'd become so attached to it and you could see it coming, the, the success of it coming. That it was like playing a sport. You didn't want to drop the ball, and that's what fun. That's what funds management is. I mean, it's 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 like playing, you know, it's like playing a sport. Except there's no, you know, there's no off season. Like you're constantly in it for, you know, every day of the week. Um, you know, and hopefully you love it, which you should. If you, otherwise, if you if you don't love it and you can't manage your own money, well, don't do it. 
So in the early 1990s, that's the last recession that yeah. Australia's had. And you were managing, yeah. you're 31 years old approximately then? Uh, at that stage, uh, I was 26 when I went into stock breaking. Three, yeah, about, about, yeah, about 31, 31, 32. So uh, how did you manage the portfolio through that period? Do you remember what you were, well, what you were trying well, to do? That's what I was trying to allude to, uh, to you, the lucky thing. And it's not luck. It's, the companies were good, solid companies. And it, it formed the basis of you know what we went to the market with. Basically, the companies were companies that made a profit. They had sound balance sheets and a good management team. And typically, it had been you know, around for a number of years. On the other side of that, the companies that we didn't own, like the Bond Corps, the uh, the Quintexes, uh, and the entrepreneurial index in 87 was almost 20% of the, the All Ordinaries Index, were all highly leveraged, um, um, basically speculative uh, asset plays that, that were using a lot of it, you know, John Spalvers and Adelaide Steamship. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have, have any of those in the portfolio. So that side went for us not owning those, and on the other side we had a number of good quality companies that survived. Um, but probably the one mistake we we did make, well, it you know we became probably overly cautious as markets corrected, um, and uh, as markets picked up, obviously as you go out of a bear market on the other side, of that there's a bull market coming. So you know perhaps early on we were positioned coming out of that bear market uh, conservatively, and uh, you know it went against us. But but all the way through, all, all the way through that style of investing in. Um, conservatively geared companies that have got you know an earnings track record uh, is stuck with me, and I, I'm still very very attached to it. So for non-Australian investors, the Entrepreneurs Index was uh, a group of guys who were basically takeover leverage buyout guys who pyramided up, and um, eventually they all almost to the man all went bust, and a few of them ended up in jail. So it became it became a bit of a uh, – it wasn't a word that you like to have applied to you in Australia for a while after that, right, the entrepreneur? That's right. But on the other side of that, you had a banking sector that was willing to lend them money, um, you know, at rates of 13 to 20% and, and they'd happily do it. And then, you know, Paul Keating in the background, uh, you know, took us into the famous cliche of the recession we had to have. And, you know, 87 had happened, so the asset prices were falling as well. Um, and on the other side of that, interest rates were up and becoming, <laughs> you know, we're a long way away from 13 to 20 percent interest rates today. And it's, and it's perhaps interesting to think back on that in the sense that, you know, maybe, you know, a marginal rise with a lot of leverage in terms of volume, you know, may have the same dramatic effect. So you, you, you start out running there and, and you get a pretty, you start putting up a pretty good track record and you get some flows into, yeah. do, you, do you know how, do you remember what sort of, flows you were getting through that period? Well, again, when, when you go into a bear market, you don't only get flows, but you also get markets falling and, and outflows. And I can, you know, and, and they, they don't sound like big figures today, but, you know, when the markets were falling, um, you know, 3 or 4% a month or something as they were, you know, we were getting 20 to $30 uh, million dollars a month in a month, which, you know, which, which was good and it, Gradually, the fund started growing, and we were getting the you know the net inflows. And I should also say, at the time, it was an environment where I had a lot of respect, and we had a lot of respect for some of our competitors. It was a time when guys like Greg Perry at uh, Colonial First State, uh, probably the best fund manager I've ever seen, uh, was starting out. David Paradise was starting out, and another guy that's no longer with us, Robert Maple Brown, was also there. So out of those twenty fund managers that were around at the time, you know, five. Five to maybe seven of them were, were ones that you really respected. And on the other side of that, another five or seven were ones that were copying all the outflows that weren't going to survive. And I think the surprising thing as well is that it took a long time for people to realise that superannuation was coming, funds under management was uh, could only grow and there was legislative growth in it. And it probably gave us time to all fine-tune ourselves and, you know, and, and run with it. And and in, in a time where interest rates were falling and the attraction to equities was growing, it, uh, you know, it helped. It's, that's how, basically how an industry was built. So you ran um, Perpetual and I, it, it topped out, according to some of the articles that I read, it topped out at about $13 billion Aussie under your 
management yeah, team? Yeah, in domestic, in, in domestic acres it did, yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but with me, uh, we, and we had to, with that growth, we had to do, it, we had to do a few things. And, uh, um, and, and a, lot of, a lot of the things were, were I don't want to sound arrogant saying this, were, were actually quite smart at the time in the sense that um, a couple of the fund managers I, I was working with, um, you know, uh, they took money on and, and managed it, and we split the. I split the industrial share fund with John Seville, and it became basically a competition between myself, which was good. It was a good internal competition in terms of he got half the portfolio and I got half the portfolio, and and underneath that we had you know maybe five or six analysts coming to us with with recommendations, but we also developed over time a method of measuring those analyst recommendations and rewarding them. Uh, based upon those recommendations, and all, it's, it's all what the industry is doing today, but to some extent, some don't. But it was, uh, you know, it was it was entrepreneurial sort of stuff. And as we grew, you know, again, not trying to be arrogant with it, one of the things that we learned when we were managing, large, you know, larger and larger amounts of money, it's, you know, you can't always move, particularly in somewhat of liquid stocks, um, the money around. So we became, as time went on, you know, more and more aggressive. In trying to direct companies um, in terms of their thought process, and took companies on at AGMs where we thought they were doing stupid things, and uh, became quite public about it. But only for the reason it was being used as a tool to 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 try and protect our position. And you know, I can still remember we took AMP on at an AGM uh, after they had listed. They, you know. It's most of companies, a lot of Australian companies have done, and they, they, they were spending the free cash flow and making stupid acquisitions overseas. And we were one of the first companies that went to an AGM and, you know, and, and voted against a, a remuneration plan, were quite vocal as to why, and, and led to change in terms of that executive team. And, and I was a, one of the ones that, that, that led, led, led that process, but it then encouraged others within perpetually do the same sort of thing. And I remember Matt and John both, and we all came together and went down that path to try and protect ourselves in terms of our position as we grew. And um, for no, as I said, for no other reason. that You know, we always viewed that we were managing other people's money and we were trying to perform for those people. It wasn't our money that we were managing, it was other people's and we had to protect it. So that's uh, maybe an early form of activism in Australia. Was anybody else doing anything like that? Are you guys introduced that? Well, we didn't introduce it for the sake of introducing it. We had to try and uh, we were. Uh, I know it sounds, it sounds. I hope it doesn't sound reckless, but we were trying to learn as we were. We were learning as we, we went along, to, uh, Toby. I mean, you know. I mean, if you, you you're not. I, th- I should also say, look. I think one of the things that gets missed in fund management is you're not going to get every call right. And if you're only if you get if you're getting seven out of ten calls right, you're doing a fantastic job, right? And the three that you're not getting right. You've got to try when you're managing more and more money. You've got to try and work out a way of trying to save that position or making it up elsewhere. And 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 a lot of times these companies weren't bad. They weren't bad companies. They were solid companies, but they were being badly led. And uh, and you know and as I said, this is this is in the 1990s. Yes, we were probably at the forefront of that. But it wasn't it wasn't for the sake of of you know to try and be an activist. It was it was it was what we were trying to do to to do the job we were doing for other people. So uh, in 2002, you launched your own firm called 452 Capital. Yep. Where does the name 452 come from? Well, it's like, you know, um, when you go out, oh, let's just go back a step. At the same time that superannuation has been introduced, um, union-based industry funds have also uh, been created and... And today they control, um, you know, effectively a third, I don't know the exact figures, but let's say a third to 50% of the, the pool of money um, of domestic equities in the Australian marketplace. So if there's 30% of that 2.5 trillion going to domestic equities, the industry funds have got control of that. And they all grew basically when superannuation was introduced. And uh, one thing that's underplayed a lot uh, in the Australian market, particularly with regards to the industry fund, the success is that 
one of the things they got right is they backed uh, by consultants, perhaps the best fund managers in Australia. And I'm not talking about myself and saying this, but other guys like you know, David Paradise and, uh, and the like, uh, they were very successful in that and, it, and that drove their performance. So that was in the context of, and I was managing money, a lot of retail money, and I was also uh, involved and met, uh, in managing money for, for some of the industry funds. And, and perpetually got the, you know, got the 13, 13 billion dollars in domestic equities. Let's say that's the figure. At the same time, you know, John and Matt Williams were, um, you know, becoming successful in their own right, and there'd, there'd been a, um, you know, there was something to fall back on. Uh, it was, it wasn't just me, and and at the same time, boutiques in Australia were starting, you know, were available and starting to. Um, be an area of perhaps you know, having a go or setting up your own boutique. So I, so I went out with a guy called Warwick Negus, um, and we founded Four Five Two. And the name Four Five Two comes from um, a cricket, the Australia's best cricketer, Sir Donald Bradman's highest cricket score. And like anything, Toby, you're trying to find a name for a company, something that you know you can attach to. And as I said to you at the start, you know, one of the reasons we chose Four Five Two as the name is because it's um, it's it's a sporting score. It's a very high score. You know, Bradman had you know had been very successful. And as I said to you, sport. Um, you know, I believe you know funds management's a lot like a sport. And 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 so we chose four five two as the name. And and the 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 other the other side effect of that is that the actual. You know the, the you know Bradman was um, you know obviously someone with a lot of integrity and um, and it's what we wanted to you know to base ourselves on. Bradman for uh, for non Australian listeners for my US listeners is the Babe Ruth of yeah. probably yeah. global cricket. So he averaged yeah. ninety nine point nine four, which is right. because he got out for a duck on his last. Uh, the last but time he, zero on his last year. zero on his last at bat. Know what is <laughs> but he, on his he, last bat. if he'd averaged a hundred, that's that's like averaging four hundred in uh, in baseball, and there's only a handful of guys who've done that. So he, nobody's actually ever done it. Nobody's nobody's ever got a better average than Bradman before or since. So that's ninety nine point nine four is an incredibly high score, and four hundred and fifty two has been bested, but it's taken a long time. For that to and happen, the, 400, the 452 was not out too, Toby. So that's that's right. <laughs> so so anyway, I mean that's that's how it came together. I mean it, you know it was something we were comfortable with, and it, you know it was good. And but you know if we explore that a little bit more, I mean, um, so we set up four five two. Um, I think I, I think another thing that you know should be noted is it's obviously if you're a fund manager. Um, you're successful at what you do, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it or you wouldn't be surviving. You know, one of the things you learn when you set up your own company is not only that um, you've also got a company to run and to be profitable, but you've also got to manage people. And, uh, you know, I think one of the hardest things for a, for a boutique fund manager, it's easy to go out and set one up, but it's, it's harder to manage people and, and deal with that um, in terms of, you know, and you know, adding to the stress or whatever it's called in terms of trying to manage a portfolio as well. And I think, you know, one of the things that we got right early at 452 is I left a lot of that to Warwick. He wasn't managed. I was managing the money and Warwick effectively handled the business and uh, the managing of the people. Was it a relief to get a blank canvas and to start again? Did you, did you, what did you, what did you put on when you first started out? In terms of an investment, yeah. Well, I mean, you got to remember it's our money. It was Warwick's and my money. I think the the figures when we went out were that I had, you know, I put in one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and Warwick put in a hundred, and that was the capital base. Which, it, uh, <laughs> you know, I can remember over Christmas, I think, you know, either this is going to work or we're going. It's not going to work because there was no guarantee the money was coming to us, right? I and mean, Warwick had signed, you know, for us. You know, obviously signed off on it. It signed a lease on a you know, uh, on part of Australia Square, which, a floor of Australia Square, which which wasn't cheap. Um, and it's also in the context, like, I think the other thing that should be made is that when we were at Perpetual, and when I started at Perpetual, there was no bonuses. Like, I think I left, 
But again, it sounds a lot of money to, um, you know, when you're talking billions and that, or you're talking in, you know, when I left Petrol, I think I was getting paid, you know, four hundred, you know, four hundred thousand dollars a year or whatever, uh, with with you know with you know maybe a hundred percent bonus over the top, and um, and that's what I left on. But I had to back myself to go out and do it. I would have regretted not going out and doing what I did, but it could have all, could have all fallen over the next day. I mean, I know those figures sound bad. I'm trying to – I'm just telling you the story. That's basically it. That's all I want. <laughs> no, I was just – I just I, – I feel, you know, sometimes you feel like you're talking big, big numbers and it's it, – you know, I – as I said at the start, it was never the money that attracted us. It was not, it, it, it never has been. It was the love of what we were doing, and uh, and and you know, a lot of it turned out. You know, a lot of it, t- it turned out very well for us. No, I understand completely. And I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't. I don't want to apologise for that. I just. I also want to say a lot of it, luck plays its part, but um, you know, at times if you don't back yourself, you never see where you end up either. And so you, you you did eventually get some pretty good flows into four five two, and I was yeah. I was actually I was a junior lawyer when that four five two listing came through, and I remember the prospectus filing uh, yeah. coming across my desk and reading through it, and very interested because it was Bradman's highest score, and I knew that at the time. You you got some flows and you started building that business up. How how, how was that period of time? Well, it's you know. I, I, Let's, again, sorry to do this, but let's go back one step before that. There was an important period just before we set up four five two, and that was a dot com boom. And and in nineteen, as we know, in nineteen ninety nine through two thousand and one, um, globally all the dot com stocks boomed, and uh, for a period of time, based upon revenue with not a lot of profit, in the Australian marketplace, a company called News Corporation, which has now been broken up, but this, this Murdoch's thing. Um, and again, it shows the dynamics of the Australian index. In 2000, 2000 or 2001, it became 21% of the, the Australian market, right? And that shows you how tight this market is. And at the time, at Perpetual, we didn't own a share of News Corp. And uh, for, for all the right reasons, we thought it had too much debt, it, did, it was overvalued. And again, we were sort of novel in that thinking in the sense of, you know, even in the US today, I don't think many don't hold the, you know, the top stocks in it. But, you know, we weren't holding a stock that was 21% of the market. For, and we're telling people this for all the right reasons. But the takeover of AOL Time Warner occurred. Um, and in one day, News Corporation jumped uh, uh, jumped 15%. And, you know, we, we, we were 3% behind in one day. And... Um, you know, all the normal things sort of happen. You think of the board that, you know, we've got, we're managing a lot of money and we're underperforming not only on one day, but we're going to underperform for, for a little while on, on quarterly figures and yearly figures. And you, you go through the process of, you know, you think of the board looking at you, asking you why you're not holding News Corp and it's becoming a, um, or why haven't you held News Corp and, and not holding its effective performance, which is, you know, it's effectively becoming a business risk. And, um, so the eventual thing happened is we get a direction from the board to buy News Corporation. After it's jumped and after it's gone. And we fought, John and myself and Matt, I think, also fought that decision. But, um, but we were told to buy News Corporation and uh, um, the, the inevitable happened. You know, the dot-com, the dot-com uh, boom busted. And, and luckily, we'd only got to... Three or percent, three or four percent of News Corporation in the portfolios for all the wrong reasons. And um, but the reason I'm telling that story, it also played a part in the sense that you know I wanted to go back to trying to manage a manage more amount of money. And when we went to the market, uh, we didn't think we'd be as successful in terms of setting up four five two. We didn't think we'd be as successful as we were in raising the money as quickly as we did. And the but that whole process led to, this, you know, it helped in making that decision to get out there and having a go on my own and going back to where I started, hopefully at, at Perpetual, if that all makes sense, which, which, which it probably doesn't. But I, I did want to talk about the, the dot-com boom in the sense that it, it also helped Perpetual as well because it obviously turned the other way. And we, like we did in, in the early 1990s, um, we were positioned when the eventual, you know, bust came in a sector of the market. And then... Then when we set up four, five, two, and progress, we then go obviously into the into the you know the what 
Colmo had in 2008, uh, being the global financial crisis, and the same sort of thing happened again, um, but took a lot longer this time in terms of you know highly highly indebted companies, particularly in the US, uh, with a lot of speculation, eventually blew up. And all through those three three times, the entrepreneurs in Australia, the dot com boom, and the just preceding the global financial crisis, we rode the um, the difficulty of holding um, or, or staying true to labour, if it's the right route, in terms of being you know conservatively positioned uh, when markets go wacky and riding both sides of that that process. If that makes sense, yeah. to say. and you're a long you're a long only investor through that period. Yeah, so I've, 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 you know, I've, I've, I've never, honestly, I've never shorted, unless I've got, you know, I'm only joking, so unless I made the, the wrong buy sell decision, which I've, oh, I've never done, I've never shorted, <laughs> I've never shorted, I've never shorted stock in my life, Dave, you know, uh, and I know, I know when I'm going, when I, I know when I'm going to say this next comment, I'm going to get every shorter in Australia attack me, but I actually don't believe in shorting, I know it's, I know, I, I just, I, I don't, if you believe in investing, I don't, I don't think shorting is, is actually investing, and I, and I know I'm going to get all these people say, "Oh, but it's price discovery and all that stuff." I just don't. I just don't believe in it. And I, I it's fine. It's, it's legal. Do it. I don't mind that. But uh, I, I don't ever. I've, I've never really wanted to run a fund that you know has. Oh, I don't want that. That, that shorts companies. I because do. I, don't, I, don't, I just. I just. I can see that it can lead to. Well, you can, you can see today. It can lead to trouble in the sense of um, oh, positions being. Position for all the wrong reasons, and I don't think if, if you manage, let's say, take an extreme example. If I manage money for an industry fund, which is a union fund, um, I don't want to be shorting a company that, you know, for, that people are, are working for. I, I just, I just don't. And I know I'm going to get copied in the head for this, but I, I, I just don't believe in it. I do a little bit of shorting, Peter, but we can move on from that. <laughs> I'm sorry, you asked. Uh... In in two thousand and nine, you're diagnosed with with terminal brain cancer, given six months to live. They give you two rounds of chemo and do a biopsy, and ultimately they find that the diagnosis is yeah. uh, it, you don't have it. So it must That's have been right. incredibly devastating, incredibly difficult period of time. Ultimately, yeah, well, it's a lot. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's also important. It's, impo- it's also important to put that in. A, you know, I've been told so many times to write a book on the whole thing, and I, you know. Uh, Maybe one day I will, but um, you know, there's more. There's, there's more background with regards to that. Um, you know, I'd been up as a, you know, a fund manager for 20 years in a competitive environment, and it, um, in February 2009, I something was was going wrong uh, uh, mentally in the sense that I was. You know, I was very depressed. I was very, uh, I was burnt out. I mean, uh, um, um, and one thing led to another. And you know, when I was going through that whole process, um, um, one of the doctors uh, suggested, or one of the, you know, one of the doctors suggested that I have an MRI scan, and I had an MRI scan um, with regards to that, and. Um, the MRI scan came back with, you know, various shading on the brain. Um, um, and as I've since, since learned, you know, with, with football players or whatever, if you, if you don't want to play, if you don't want to play the next week, have an MRI scan because they're not that, uh, they're not that, uh, sometimes they're not, they're not that accurate. So I had the MRI scan that, uh, that night and, you know, I'm, you know, I rang up when we're driving home. We have to go back in and um, and have another one, have another one that night. And they're all coming back with the shading, so and no one knows what the shading is. So that leads to a biopsy where they, you know, take a part of your brain out and then go away and analyse it. And and so that you know that happens, and you know you're learning you're learning stuff as you go along. You know the most important part of your brain is at the front for anyone that wants to know, and the the stuff you, they want to take out is at the back of your brain. Um, you know because the front of the brain controls you know obviously your sight and, and other key important things. So you have that biopsy, it goes to a pathologist who I never met, and they cut they cut the 
the, they cut the, bio, the biopsy. And in the background, they're also um, putting the picture together with regards to, um, you know, circumstantially what, you know, what I'm going through. And the biology comes back, it's cut, and um, basically the cut is wrong in terms of a diagnosis. And I was diagnosed with um, a rare form of brain cancer um, and given, you know, as, as you said, given you know, six months to live and, you know, told to get your affairs in order, uh, going on chemo. Um, and, you know, uh, looking back on it, the things, you know, things you learn, learn the hard way is that things like, uh, you know, drugs, they're very powerful. And, you know, if you take a powerful drug, it takes... You know, it it can take a month to get into your system, but it can also take a month to get out of it. And there's, you know, obviously withdrawal symptoms with regards to that. Um, you know, chemo. I can still remember, you know, going to the oncologist the first time, and she was the people in the, the system are so good. Um, but obviously they do make mistakes. But you know, she was so good, and she, the first thing she said to me, she said that, uh, well, we've got to give you rat poison to make yourself better. You know, try and try and save you, and. Um, so you go under chemo and, you know, I think, it's, and I'm lucky I got through it, but, you know, for those that haven't, that's a whole process in, in itself in the sense that you, you know, you can, because the drugs are so powerful, you can no longer share toilets, you, you know, you, you're sick, um, you know, you're obviously sleeping a lot um, and, you know, that's, you know, that's adding to the whole, the whole complication of the, of the process and, uh you know, as I said, you know, I, I, you know, to be honest with you, Toby, I would have paid them a million dollars to be wrong, or, you know, ten million, borrowed ten million dollars for the to be wrong, and they and they were wrong. And you know, people sometimes ask me why, you know, why I never never sued them, and I said, you know, I've had no interest in that. As I said, I'd rather, I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather them be wrong, you know, be, you know, be wrong and the like, and uh, and that's what's happened. And the funny thing now is that you know, ten ten years later on. You know, you can see how things turned out. You can see, you can see <laughs> bizarrely, you can see that, you know, you watch kids grow up and, uh, you know, you can see, you know, the decisions that you made, might have made in that process in terms of getting your affairs in order, whether they would have been right or wrong or whatever. And it's just, it's, the whole thing's, you know, it's complicated, it's interesting. Thank God you can look back on it. So you uh, stepped back out of funds management at that time. What, yeah. what, what have you been doing for the last few years? Oh, for the last, for the last 10 years, I've effectively been managing my own money, Toby, and I, and, I, and I actually love it. I'm actually – I've had the opportunity on a few occasions to go back into it, but the market's not the, – the, 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 the dynamics of the market are not the same. Um, what do you think's changed? Well, there's, there's more – there's a lot more fund managers, as I said, trying to articulate earlier, chasing a smaller and smaller number of stocks uh, in the Australian marketplace, particularly in terms of quality. Um, the industry funds have grown so much that they're now basically going to have to, or are either index in Australia, um, or they're going to have to go globally. I'm interested in the global markets, um, and we've seen a few Australian you know, fund managers. And I think Australian fund managers can do very well globally, but that money has to, you know, has to go, go offshore. And uh, as I said, I'm, you know, I'm managing my own money, um, and that's given me the opportunity to, to 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 look at things in terms of, you know, in terms of technology and the use of it. And, you know, one of the reasons I'm talking to you today is I've never done a Skype interview before. I'm just, and I'm I'm interested in that whole that whole tech area. I mean, it's one area that Australia is. You know, well, it's not in it. Australia still, well, it's not the right word. It's still very a, a, very much a backward place in terms of technology and that sort of stuff. Well, I think the Atlassian guys have done fairly well as one of the um, one of the few that's got out listed on the Nasdaq. Yeah, well, that's the saddest thing about it. They had to go to the Nasdaq to do it, and they were successful. I mean, they're successful. And I just, I just hope Australia gets at some stage gets away from housing, digging stuff out of the ground, and relying on population growth because it's. I don't think it's it's got the same future that's had in the past unless it does. I just I just don't. And maybe again I'm wrong on that. 
So you no longer have uh, multi billions of dollars that you have to get into the companies and you don't have a board telling you to buy News Corp at the very peak. So w- what does that do to your investing? How, w- well, how do you invest point, now? Well, first, the first starting point, again, this is, this is going to sound bad, but the first starting point is as we start, and I should say this is well, Toby, I mean, and I mean it sincerely. The first, when we started at Perpetual, we had no process. We had a portfolio of stocks. Our performance, we didn't know what our performance was until three days after the end of the month. Um, our first starting point was not to lose money. And it wasn't, it wasn't, we never, we didn't, it wasn't, th- it was three years into at Perpetual before we even knew what a benchmark was. And and I wish we'd never done it, but uh, um, I've never been, you know. Uh, never found the benchmark. Well, never found. I've been benchmark unaware. I'm benchmark unaware today. I mean, you, once you go into the benchmark sort of philosophy, and they all want to do it, all the all the researchers and consultants want you to benchmark you against something, and it's 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 like it's it's like this passive thing that's playing out around the world to, today. And I'm not just saying this because I'm active and I'm a stock picker. I can see it ending in in disaster somewhere. I mean, it, it, it's just. I mean, take the News Corp example. Could you imagine if you know if the stock in the US got the twenty percent of the benchmark over there, or um, or the entrepreneurs became twenty five percent of a global market around the world? And um, it's it's going to happen, and it may well happen again here in Australia. I mean, once you go into you know once you start getting benchmark, you get you know you, you've got to find things like tracking error, which I, to this day I still don't know how you calculate, but um, uh, and Sharpie ratios or whatever they are, and it's not. It's not, it's not true stock picking. You, you, you then, so if I take that a step further, when you know when we were at four, five, two, we were, you know, we were getting performance figures on a basically on a minute by minute basis, and it's the pressure associated with just watching that performance is just so stupid and so so ridiculous. It's it's what, it's basically what funds management's become, and um, so I'm not, you know, I'm investing money where I think I. Want to and where I, you know, I should. And as I said, given that this is my money and it, it should be the same when you're managing other people's money, my first point of call is I don't want to lose it. But the trouble is in the funds management industry, you're benchmarked to a benchmark, so it's not, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't mean you, 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 your first point of call is not to lose money. Your first point of call is to outperform a benchmark, which means you could lose money. If markets go down, but you can be rewarded because you're down seven percent, and others are down, you know, fifteen percent. And the client is actually losing money and unhappy. And I think it's just, it's it's become so much tied to that that investors are no longer, well, fund managers are no longer investing, perhaps the way they they should or want. Do you still? Fo- it does. Yeah. Do Do you still follow a Peter Lynch style? Are you still well, yeah, in the context of an Australian market, I mean, it's not, you know, uh, I mean, if you look at if you look at Lynch's style, you know, you had the, you had all those cat- well, those five categories, and you know, obviously Australia's got a lot of cyclicals in it, uh, as we talked about the banks and uh, the mining stocks. I mean, the banks are interesting at the moment in the sense that they are cyclical, obviously cyclical, but they've had a period where um, interest rates have come down. There's been a housing boom in Australia, and we're sitting in a because of you know accounting policies with um, we're sitting in a situation where the bank bank bad debt charges going through the profit loss account uh, are almost zero. Um, and on the other side of that is that because of the taxation system in here with regards to the attempt to eliminate eliminate double taxation of, of profits, the distribution by dividend by um, Australian companies is very high. So we're in a position where the yield of the dividend distribution is coming out of the banks at a time when bank bad debt charges are very, very, very low, um, are very high. And in that environment, we've just had an election pulled over over dividends, basically, uh, which is which is dangerous in itself. Um, there will come a point where um, something has to give. Either bad debts have to go go up or you know, div- or and. And dividends have to come down. You think the, the payout ratios are too high? Well, they are. They are. Too, they are too high on this. They are. They are too high on a medium to long term basis. And if someone's got to do about it, something. Someone's got to do something about it because it's sucking. Uh, and it, you saw it yesterday in terms of after the election and 
the rally in the market. The, the high yielding stocks all rallied quite hard. Um, and again, it's going to attract uh, perhaps investors into a company based upon a, a dividend that may not be maintainable. And we all know that you know earnings pay dividends or free cash flow pays dividends over the over the over the longer term. I took a look at the Australian banks uh, a decade ago, taking what had happened in the recession in the early 1990s and just projecting that forward to, that was about 2009, and just seeing what that did to the big four banks in Australia. And it almost wiped out all of their equity, if you assume similar sort of loan losses. Well, well, it, 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 well if you go back to 91, 92, the thing that caught the banks out is they were recklessly lending to the entrepreneurs. It wasn't a housing bus that caught them out even though interest rates were very high. And we've never really had a house, and I'm not saying we're gonna have one, but we've never had a housing bust here in Australia. Um, and the weighting in terms of capital um, for, for housing in Australia is actually lower than it is for, for any other sort of lending. So there's that part playing into it as well. And as I said, if you just look at Westpac, and again, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying we're going to have a collapse, but we're at a point where um, they are at a cyclical high point, and it can go on for a while. But you know, in the last in the last half, Westpac's charge for, for bank bad debts was you know was nine basis points, uh, and you're talking you're talking about eight hundred eight hundred almost eight hundred billion dollars worth of loans, and um, and putting that in the context of you know banks are heavily leveraged. Um, where it doesn't matter whether they're Australian banks or global banks or whatever, and the 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 uh, the liabilities are thirteen times, roughly thirteen times what the net tangible asset backing is of the banks. To put that in the context in terms of leverage, um, it doesn't take much if things do go bad to wipe that capital out. And I think the other thing that gets lost with regards to capital is the capital is is set at ten percent, but if it gets wiped out, you've got to rebuild it, and you've got to be rebuilding in the time. If that does play out at a time when you know confidence is suppressed, I and mean, that's what happened with regards to Westpac in Westpac and ANZ in early ninety one, ninety two, and they were very lucky to a large extent that you know someone like Kerry Packer came in and, and effectively underwrote the Westpac rising. So you, you don't you don't look outside the Australian market for for any investment. I do. I do I'm, trying, I'm trying to learn about it, and I do. I do a little bit, but not not greatly. In a sense, I. I I've always believed I, I knew the Australian market, I knew the Australian companies, and I was restricted to that, obviously, running money. Uh, but I'm trying to learn more and more. Not, not so much learn, but uh, you know, get a feel for the, for the overseas markets more and more. Any, anything interesting that you've bought recently or that you're looking at that you're, you're prepared to share? Uh, more immediate. And this is, this is again, it's only... Uh, uh, um, it's, it's a little bit thematic, but I mean, again, trying to go back to um, uh, Peter Lynch's, uh, and, I, and I'm coming from, a, I'm actually a pessimist, Toby. I mean, I, I know that sounds a stupid thing to say, but um, uh, I'm not, a, not an eternal optimist, so I'm always, I'm always pretty cautious. But I think one of the interesting things in the market at the moment, in the Australian market at the moment, is that we went through a period, say, two years ago, uh, where a lot of in listed investment companies came to the marketplace um, uh, and listed. Um, and like a lot of things, when there's a lot of them listed at the same time, um, opportunities get th thrown up, you know, two or three years later. And all, you know, I'm not articulating it properly, but there's a number of listed investment companies there that are trading at, you know, you know particularly global ones that are trading up to 15% for, Discounts to the hard, the hard underlying portfolios, and that's that's one of the areas in the last you know a couple of weeks that I've sort of been you know redeploying some money. I know that sounds very basic, but um, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I actually at the moment I am I'm actually quite uh, cautious on markets, given that you know obviously you know Wall Street and the like trade trade wars to one side. Uh, are at pretty high levels. Valuations are pretty high. You've got a lot of unicorns coming to the market that, <laughs> that don't make a lot of money and probably won't. So it feels like it's very late cycle. And we're in an environment where interest rates around the world 
you know, in a lot of places have never been lower. We've got negative interest rates that, you know, are accounting for, you know, a lot of um, a lot of global capital allocation. Um, and on the other side of that, debt globally is is very very high. Um, um, in a funny sort of way, Australia's despite it's geared towards banking to a less extent towards mining, I don't think is 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 as badly placed as some of the places around the world in terms of euphoria and in terms of the how to put it that sort of analysis. The, the Australian market suddenly just got back close to or just over its 2007 peak. Do you, do you have any thoughts on the valuation well, of the market? Is it, there's another dynamic. There's, there's another dynamic that we touched on um, before. Um, the, the one big thing and the one big differential between the Australian market and, say, the US market is that um, dividends as a percentage of profits, uh, their payouts in Australia are a lot higher. Um, so, and the dynamic of the Australian market, not only is it skewed towards banking and mining, but there are a lot of listed companies that are operating in oligopoly slash duopoly mon- monopoly positions, i.e. they as Peter Lynch would say, the, the mature companies um, uh, or stalwarts, but they're paying out a lot of their profits in dividends. So the accumulation effect on the market in Australia compared to the US is a lot greater, um, whereas the capital growth in the US market is a lot greater. Now, you know, I think we're at a, at, at a very important inflection, inflection point in Australia in the sense that... Um, if Australia is to have a future and not be based just around banking and mining, companies have to have to retain earnings and start to grow, and there has to be a marketplace for uh, uh, entrepreneurial or you know, te- te- to use an example, technology companies in Australia to grow. And it, it, it's being wasted in the context of, as I said, that the retirement savings system in Australia at the moment is around about two point five trillion dollars, and it's tipped to grow, perhaps by the end of this decade to Know, four or five trillion, and there's a big pool of money there, and it's not so much being wasted, but you know, with the allocation still to Australian companies from that money being between 25 and 30 percent, unless things change, that can't be sustainable. It'd be a shame to waste that opportunity, um, and you know, develop other areas here domestically with regards to it. What should they oh, do? Yeah. What, what should they do with it? Well, yeah, I, don't think, I don't think you can ever direct or invest in where you want it to go, but you have to put the framework in place that, you know, a say, for example, a, a technology hub or whatever um, can flourish. And entrepreneurs, uh, you know, whether, I mean, I, I've always had my doubts whether an Airbnb or a Uber could ever have, have ever got off the ground here in Australia. And I think the alleys are... Guys have proven have proven that in the sense that they had to go to the Nasdaq to list. That uh, you know Australia is a very hard place to get companies up and going. Um, its wage its wages are very high in terms of competition, but there's no reason um, there's no reason that it can't you know tap you know technology whether it's you know extending that to AI or extending it to whatever. Uh, because I don't think I think Australians are actually quite smart and entrepreneurial. It's a matter of giving them encouragement to do that. And as I said in the background, there's this big pool of money that is there to be, you know, is there to be you know, perhaps accessed. Particularly why there's still this this crazy allocation of 25 to 30 percent going to Australian equity, which is dangerous unless things change. Well, Peter, thanks very much. We're coming up on the end of the time. If uh, folks want to follow you, you're on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle? Just uh, remind me again. I'm sure what it is, mate. It's, uh, it's Peter Morgan at psimpsonmorgan.com. And look, I've got to stress, the only reason I'm doing that is I'm trying, I'm trying to learn about technology, Toby. So it's, uh, and I do, I do think there is a lot of good stuff on – there's a lot, obviously a lot of bad stuff on Twitter as well, but there's a lot, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of good information there that's at your hands. So I'm just trying to learn from it. Well, hopefully, one day, we'll... I may, one, one, one day I may well disappear from it. <laughs> well, we might so, pick, pick up. Maybe this, I mean, this is a bit of a learning experience as well. Uh, we'll pick you up some some more followers, Peter Simpson Morgan. I'm not in it for that reason, as I said. <laughs> Peter Simpson Morgan, thank you very much. All right, Toby. All the best to everyone. <laughs>